Adam Frosch, a successful doctor living the dream in sunny Florida. Dr. Adam Frosch, he's a uh, very flamboyant, extravagant uh, individual. He was a podiatrist by trade, and he uh, had a lot of money that he spent. He loved uh, luxurious cars, trips, he gambled quite frequently, and uh, he also had a some type of infatuation with exotic dancers. I believe at one point I noticed he had 81 cars registered to him. 81 cars? And there was multiple that weren't registered to him that he owned. You had a very lavish lifestyle. Mm. Depends on who you compare it to. Compare it to Donald Trump, no. If you compare it to a janitor, yes. <laughs> While separating from his second wife, Adam traveled to Paris and met Samra. According to her best friend Jackie Watson, Samra was a shooting star from Madagascar on the fast track to fame. She was a model. She was a model in Paris. She was, a, she was on her way up. Before she became a mother, Samira always wanted to have a career as a singer. And she was a good singer, you know. I don't know if you saw the videos, but she was a really good singer. They do not do well. Where were you two married? We first got married in Las Vegas, um, and then we had a formal wedding in Madagascar about six months later. They had two little girls, and they settled into a swanky life into a gated Tallahassee neighborhood. I think she was a good mom. She seemed very interested in providing the best life for her children. She had an interesting way of going about that, which you know might be somewhat controversial, but I do think she was a good mother. Sky, get mommy a little bit. You like it? Do you like it? Ooh, you're making a mess. From everything we can tell, she was very attentive to the children and, and wanted the children to be the center of attention everywhere they went. She would parade the kids around in very expensive strollers and clothing and tried to start a clothing line for one of her daughters and threw up a one-year birthday party, one-year-old birthday party for one of the daughters that most people wouldn't throw for a wedding. She was the best mother ever. She was a very nurturing. She loved her girls more than her own life. Skyna, look at mommy. Hey, Skyna. <laughs> She's like, uh-uh. Their lifestyle was very unorthodox, very flashy, flamboyant type of way of dressing, the vehicles they rode in, the way that they furnished their home. Lots of gold, lots of marble. I think over the top for, for most people's taste. You, know, you had animals, you know, from the jungle, uh, stuffed animal, but the real thing, you know, you have zebra. We definitely discovered from uh, family and friends of Samra's that she was in fact high maintenance. Uh, I think she knew that Adam could provide a lifestyle um, something that she was demanding. But beneath the surface of this life of excess, there were signs of trouble. The money wasn't just from his podiatry practice. Investigators say there was some dirty money too. I, I know there was some um, investigation uh, from the feds uh, looking into some of his books, but uh, he, he made a lot of money for his trade. I learned that he had multiple extramarital affairs going on throughout the course of his marriage. I learned that he was engaged in Medicaid fraud to the tune of many hundreds of thousands of dollars. What kind of relationship did Adam and Samra have? Everything I can tell is pretty violent. Um, From it, physical abuse, it, physical verbal. Physical abuse, verbal abuse, mental for sure. Um, you know, and Adam had multiple, multiple girlfriends. He also fathered a child with one of those girlfriends. That's where I really found out the nightmare that she was living in. When Sam and I had a fallen out during our engagement period and had a child with a woman outside of wedlock, but it wasn't a planned thing, it was, you know, and we dated for just a short period of time. But Adam's father says there were problems with Samra as well. In fact, he claims she wasn't a model at all. Later on, we found out that uh, she wasn't really a model, that this was all fabricated. Adam kind of built it up with her. The reported episodes of violence escalated. He had a very short temper, and when it when his temper went south, it was pretty bad. He could be violent very quick. 
every time that she was confronting him about his cheating, you know, he was getting violent because he was feeling trapped, she was telling me. So he would get very aggressive with the throw, uh, putting back on the bed. Friends say Samara was terrified of her husband, but Dr. Frosch claims he was the victim of a violent alcoholic. She would get sometimes in a, like a jealous rage or mood, even though I wasn't doing anything or flirting or anything, but she'd just get in these moods sometimes, especially if she was drinking. Were you physically violent to your wife? Never. No. Never? Never. Not one time? No. But you do admit there were fights in your household. Well, when, if you'll say fights, it's, it's like, it wasn't like me returning the aggression or anger. I'd try to calm her and say, baby, I love you, calm down, you know. And so when people were there, they, they didn't understand her because they didn't love her like I did. And they would, you know, say, how can you tolerate that or whatever. But I said, when you love somebody, tolerate. But that's all I knew she had a condition, you know, it was mostly you know, hormonally related. Adam claims he caught this argument on video while on family vacation. Okay. I don't want to, please. Make no, baby. Okay. No. I'll tell you, you put us in the next airplane. You're not standing here, Adam. No. Who took that video? It was almost like it was set up so she didn't know he was filming it to catch her yelling at him. It was very tumultuous. They were on again, off again. They were toxic together. They were toxic. They would get in an argument, and for him to get her back, he would send photographs of hundreds of dollar bills on the bed in I love you, and that was what would bring her back to the house. On the surface, Adam and Samara Frosch seemed to have an enviable life. They had multiple houses in Tallahassee, houses in Thomasville, houses all around the southeast. My first impression when I met Adam Frasch, I actually liked him. A lot of charisma, and he was taking care of, you know, his wife and the little girl. To me, they seemed the perfect couple. They were raising two little girls while residing in the lap of luxury. It's the one of the premier neighborhoods in Tallahassee. It's a very affluent neighborhood. She wanted to develop, you know, the girls basically with social media, reality show, little movie, whatever she could do for them. But for a wealthy doctor who had a taste for strippers, speedboats, and fast cars, domestic tranquility was a bitter pill to swallow. I think Adam thought maybe he could have Samra, the kids, and his lifestyle too, and um, that wasn't the case. He was totally unfaithful. He had at least three affairs with three separate exotic dancers two of whom worked at the same club. But Adam denies these allegations, sort of. Were you faithful to her? Yes, I mean, except for when she filed for divorce, um, I started dating, and I dated like three different women during that time. Samara, a native of Madagascar who spoke French, found herself with few options. I think Adam had the capability of holding some things over Samara um, in regards to monetary. She didn't have family in town, she had limited friends, she spoke limited English, uh, she wasn't working. She was very much alone, you know, in this country, she and her kids, and she didn't understand the system. She didn't know how to get a lawyer, how to get custody, and she was completely reliant on him. The mounting tension led to an altercation that finally got the attention of police. And then she got physical and started hitting me, scratching, but I knew even not even put my hands up to protect myself. And she'd say, I tried to, you know, hit her or something. So I just stayed there and she almost choked me unconscious. He'd back away, he'd never do anything. He's mild tempered like that. She had actually been arrested uh, for domestic violence against Adam. The police were called, she was charged, but those charges were dropped. Yes. Why? Um, that's a good question. He had the, the cops coming over, uh, pretending that she hurted him physically, and then he took the kids. <sighs> Such a nightmare. Adam was given temporary custody of the kids, an agonizing time for Samara. I know when he took the babies away from her, man, she, talk, she cried, and I cried with her. It was horrible. That's why I don't understand how the cops were giving him the benefit of the doubt when she was the one who was getting hurt. While the couple continued their on-again, off-again ways, Samra began to get the upper hand. She would go into Adam's phone, you know, look up these contacts, 
and she was very bold and she would just, you know, call them. So she was doing her own investigative work. Correct. Trying to figure out who these women were. Anything she could. The pages are kind of flipped. Samra ended up getting custody of the children and the marital estate and was starting to push back against Adam because of the, the multiple affairs that he had had. What was their relationship like in the days leading up to Samra's death? Back and forth. They would fight up and, and they up. would make up and they would fight and they would make up. It was progressively getting worse as far as the, uh, the violence. She would confide in multiple friends of hers that um, Adam had threatened to kill her. Reports had suggested that she was in fear of her safety or in fear of you finding out and that you were going to snap on her. No, that was never the case. I never threatened her ever. There's no history of that. Then, a major turning point. Semra receives an extortion offer from one of Adam's mistresses who offers to sell her a sex tape. Starring the good doctor. And she said it was her husband having sex. And she said, you, it's so disgusting, Jackie. You're not gonna believe this. Were you able to verify that story or corroborate it in any way? One of the girlfriends during her interview said Samra approached her about $4,000 for a sex tape between the two. Then came the night of February 22nd. Samra had filed for divorce and technically, she and Adam were separated with Samra in sole possession of the kids and house. But Adam claims they were in a period of reconciliation. Especially around the time of her death, were you together? Yes, we were together. 100%. 100%. No, he was not supposed to go to, this, to, to go to that house, but he was still coming night and day hunting her. He was hunting her. The family spent the day out of town. That night, as seen on the surveillance video, Adam stopped in an auto garage where Semra picked up her Hummer, transferred the kids' car seats, and headed home. We can also see her returning to her gated community of Golden Eagle at approximately 11 p.m., followed by Adam in the black SUV. What time did you and Samra go to bed? After the babies went to bed, we went out in the living room, we were talking, and then we made love. Um, and then went to bed approximately 1, 1.30, somewhere around that range. And you had sex where? In the living room? Yes. So you leave the living room and both of you go up to the bedroom to sleep? Correct. Did both of you argue that night? No. Was there an explosive fight of any no. sort? No. The next morning, Adam can be seen leaving with both kids in tow. The next movement we can document is at Eight o'clock on the dot, he's pulling out of Golden Eagle. And then what else does he claim? That she wanted a break from the kids and that he was going to take the kids to either Miami or Panama City and that she was going to meet them there after a couple day break. A lot of times I'd give her a mama's day off on the weekends to get her hair done, her nails done, go get her waxing done, all those things. Approximately three hours later, Gerald Gardner, the family handyman, can be seen entering through the gate along with his 13-year-old son. Minutes later, Gardner makes this horrifying call to 911. 911, what's the address again? Ma'am, can I get an officer out here in Golden Eagle? It's a lady laying in the pool in her backyard in her pool. She did. Okay. All right, she's laying in the pool? Yes, ma'am. I don't know what happened. I just got here to do some work before I talked to her yesterday. Are you with the patient now? Ma'am, I don't know. She got some kids. I don't know where the kids are. Okay. I don't know nothing. I just pulled up and I just walked back there in the pool every year. She was laying in the pool. Okay. Is she awake? No, ma'am. She, okay. she, she, she did. Is there any way you can jump in and get her? Well, ma'am, she's she been in there. I don't know how long. She's she, she, she completely gone. And I want y'all to come take pictures of it before I take her out. I've got somebody coming. I just wanted to make sure that... You know, we could try and get her help if we could, but you said she's completely gone? Yeah, she, 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 she did. She drowned. Somebody, some, somebody had to kill her. Samra's sandal is found wrapped around a hose. Did she trip and fall? Or was there something far more sinister to blame? Samra Frosch, a former model, pop singer, and now the mother of two, is found at the bottom of a pool by the family handyman. Gerald Gardner had uh, come to the uh, to the state. He goes into the screen patio where the pool is and finds uh, Samra at the bottom of the pool uh, in the deep end laying on her back. 
He immediately called 911. Okay. Is she awake? No, ma'am. She, okay. she's, she's dead. According to District Attorney Georgia Koppelman, Semra's tumultuous five-year marriage to this man, Dr. Adam Frosch, was finally coming to a tragic end. She had to try to find a way to get away from him, and I think she was working on that, and I think she was succeeding, and that's, that's what he couldn't tolerate. But Adam claims Semra was alive and well when he left his kids that morning. So you put both babies in the car, and you leave. Right, and I, I kissed her goodbye and said, you know, I'll you know, catch up with these later and said, okay, you know. Investigator Jason Newland says that Adam and his girls are seen later that day on this bank security video where he withdrew five grand in cash. Do you know what he was planning to do with that money? No, no, I don't know, but I, I what do you believe he was preparing to run. Adam traveled to his beach home in Panama City making several calls to Semra's phone. Hey, I just wondered if you got up okay and said something about having Jay come over and help you with cleaning up and that. I know you wanted some time to yourself, but um, these babies are a lot of work. But um, it make it here and get things squared away in Panama City and tell me what you want to do. If you want to come over here, if you're, you're on Salve, if you just want to be by yourself, let me know. But I love you. And, um, it's all going to work out, baby. I love you. Bye. He left several voicemails on Samra's phone. Honey, I'm worried about you. Wake up. You know, call me, is your phone dead? What's going on? Just random voicemails throughout the day. Samra, please turn on your phone. I need to know where you're at, what you're going and doing. And oh, you're upset, so let me know what's going on. That afternoon, Adam received a disturbing call from a friend. He called Adam to say, hey, I just got word from a police buddy of mine that There's something going on, something's going on at your house and Samra's dead in your pool. He said that he'd you know, heard through a friend of ours that um, Sam had drowned in the pool and I broke down and was crying. They were to get their relationship back together just before this happened. He was really upset. According to Detective Anthony Giraldi, police immediately went looking for Dr. Frosch. We arrested him while he was coming out of his home in Panama City. Adam is taken to the station where he's grilled for several hours and his story doesn't add up. For example, here's the exchange about the night before Samra was found dead. So did you follow her back home? Yeah, I followed her to go meet him. Before y'all got there, how did, where, did y'all stop at the gate? Yeah. Were you guys I, arguing then? Not really. Did you open the door to her car? I don't think so. I remember my dad was there. I mean, ask her if she had my clicker or something. Well, I can tell you that on, on the video, it shows you opening the door and her slamming. Well, that might have, yeah. Cops also want to know where Adam got injured. How did you say you got the scratch? The baby was playing around as a 10 month old. Right. Mm -hmm. So you try to make me believe that a 10 month old has nails enough to make that type of scratch on your face? Yeah. So what happened when y'all get to the house? She started drinking champagne. How much do you think she had to drink? I would say close to a couple bottles of champagne. By herself? By herself. And, um, kind of, you know, kind of slurring her words. Was there any alcohol in Samra's body? Zero alcohol in her body. But Adam now says it could have been non-alcoholic champagne that made his wife slur her words. So you did. did see her drinking something. Right, and I told You're not sure that. if it, there was alcohol in it or right, not. Correct, correct, because it could have been the non-alcoholic ones. Another problem, Adam's hasty departure with the kids the next morning. She just wanted a break. If I could give her a break from the babies. I kind of just kept them in the middle of the night. I didn't want to bother and wake her up. It was extremely unusual for him to take the children anywhere without Samra. Um, it was extremely unusual for those girls to leave the house in their jammies. They were celebrity babies. They were dressed to the nines every single time they left the house. Then there was this curious remark about the crime scene, which Adam had supposedly not seen. What do you think? I don't know. I, I'm worried that she may have tripped on the um, water hose that was out there, or the poop or something, or trying to chase Bella around the pool. Trash, uh, I'm going to be honest with you, that's not what happened. Me and you both know she that's wasn't chasing the dog around the pool, tripping well, Bella. I don't know what happened. 
The scene looked staged. Absolutely. I mean, she didn't die from an accident. The medical examiner was 100% on that. So why is there a hose with a flip-flop tucked under it? And then when he's interviewed by law enforcement, first thing out of his mouth is, gee, I sure hope she didn't trip over that hose in those cheap flip-flops and fall in the pool. She doesn't swim. She might have bumped her head. It's like, give me a break. In fact, Samra's friend Jackie says she was terrified of water. Samira did not know how to swim. And the reason why I know that is because we joke. I don't know how to swim either. When I was present, she never went around the pool. She didn't teach her how to swim. Let me tell you something. I've been doing this for 20 years. Right. You done sat up here and broke down in your own way of crying. I don't know how many times, and not one tear has dropped out of your eye yet. Well, I've, I've already teared out for six hours here, sir. The way the scene was set up and his statements about the way the scene was set up was the nail in the coffin for me. Semra Frosch is found dead at the bottom of her pool at the age of 38. The medical examiner's report confirms the worst fears this was no accident. It was blunt force trauma, a couple were drowning. She was hit in the head with some object, a fist, a golf club, we don't know, fell and cracked her head on some hard, flat surface, possibly the pool deck. And then while she was still alive, suffering from a massive head injury, was put into the pool to drown. Adam said Samra drank two bottles of champagne that night. Does that jive with the medical examiner's report? Not one bit. What does the medical examiner say? She had zero alcohol in her system. Adam also claims that he and Samra were back together again at the time of her death, a claim the prosecutor isn't buying. You really kind of have to look at the big picture of the relationship and how she really was getting the upper hand as far as getting possession of the house, um, custody of the children, alimony. The tide had turned, and I think that was not acceptable to Mr. Frash. But in his testimony to police, Adam definitely had another suspect in mind, Gerald Gardner, the handyman who made the gruesome discovery. We're not going to tell you everything we know. I understand. That is the best. best. I could see the body or see what may have happened or if there's foul play or if Gerald did something or if they got in an altercation or I don't know. I wasn't there, so I don't know. Did you ever look at Gerald as a possible person of interest? Because you had to. Well, it, it's natural in an investigation. You start really close. Who do they know? Who's? I mean, he found her He there. found her. You start first person to find her. What, what did you see? What did you do? Where have you been? Adam even suggested that Samra was having an affair with Gerald. Adam was the type that he believed anybody Samra had in contact with uh, was having an affair with. Gardner? No. Was she in an affair? No. I don't believe that at all. I mean, it's just impossible to believe that someone else came in and killed this woman. But prosecutors say Gerald had his own theory as well. When law enforcement arrived, he told them he did it, he finally killed her, and he was referring to the defendant. So he immediately assumed that she'd been murdered by her husband. As for motive, many believe Adam was worried that a sex tape featuring him and a girlfriend would give Samra valuable ammunition in divorce proceedings. He provided some information in regards to a sex tape that Samra was trying to buy off of one of his girlfriends and confronted Adam with this. You're telling me she was not angry that night because of a sex tape you made with an ex-girlfriend? No. She had mentioned that earlier in the week. Um, and, and she was saying that they were going to give her, or she had to pay them money to get this or something. And I was like, you know, I didn't add, add up. I believe that uh, Adam Fresh killed Samira because when that day she received that DVD, she was so disappointed, hurt, enraged. 
and I tried to calm her down that night and said, Samira, you gotta keep calm. You cannot get upset with him because he's gonna become dangerous because he's gonna feel like he is corner. I believe that she could have definitely pushed him too far. Did you kill your wife? No. Was there an explosive fight and you put her in the pool and tried to cover up something that happened? No. But the medical examiner also deals a blow to the DA's case. And what were you able to prove about Samara's time of death? Nothing. I mean, we knew she was alive when she came through the gates and her last phone activity, and that was it. We, we knew she was killed sometime between then and 11 a.m. The medical examiner that actually examined the body in the case was not able to give a time of death because of the cold water in the pool, which affected the decomposition of the body to the extent that there was just no way to say when she went in. And if that weren't enough, a neighbor states that he saw someone who looked very much like Samara in her driveway at 10.30 the morning of her death, hours after Adam had left with the kids. He is adamant he sees a black female alive in this driveway because there's never been anybody at this house before. This is the house with all the cars. And I, I just think the neighbors got the wrong day. Despite these obstacles, Assistant State's Attorney Georgia Kappelman makes her case to the grand jury to bring murder charges against Dr. Frosch. In a surprising twist, Adam makes a public plea, publishing this letter directly aimed at prosecutors with questions like, quote, what evidence do you have that I have any reason to kill my wife? Why did you write the letter to the people of Tallahassee? Just to explain you know, my innocence and that in the media, the way they were treating me and exposing all this, you know, negative publicity and that. Do you think he thought, I can talk my way out of this? Absolutely. He testified to the grand jury, I think, believing he could talk his way out of it to the grand jury. And what did you think about the letter he wrote to the public? It, I came to know that it was in character for him. I think he thought he could go into the grand jury and convince him he had nothing to do with it. He was wrong. Dr. Frosch is charged with first degree murder. Nearly three years after the death of Samara Frosch, her husband, Dr. Adam Frosch, stands trial for first degree murder. Your initial thoughts when this case first came across your desk? Uh, oh crap. <laughs> I knew it was gonna be a challenging case. Prosecutor Georgia Koppelman faces two major obstacles. The first, no definitive time of death due to the frigid temperature of the pool. And the first responders that jumped in to fetch the body out of the water described the water as being extremely cold. The pool temperature was either 56 or 57 degrees when it was tested later the evening after the homicide. The defense attorney jumps all over it. The body is found at 11 a.m some three hours after Dr. Frosch leaves his residence. The medical examiner is going to testify she found no evidence of wrinkling on either the feet or the fingers of the deceased. The second challenge, a witness who claims he saw Samara alive hours after Adam left the home. If a neighbor puts he her puts in that her. driveway. If it's not her. Then who is it? Is it the real killer? But that was a big worry. For over two years, it was one. That's why the case wasn't charged. And when you walked by between 1025 and 1045, did you see anybody in the driveway of that house? We did. I saw a woman, African-American, tall, dark hair, uh, thin. What did you think when you heard this? It, it was somewhat of a relief in the sense that, you know, I, she was alive. You know, I like I had some evidence to prove that. And this neighbor has not changed his story? Never changed his story. He believes he saw her outside. Uh, and some and would his say teenage daughter. He had his teenage daughter walking with him, too, and she said the same thing. I just think he's wrong on the wrong day. You don't believe that there was a woman in that driveway that could have killed her? No, not one bit. Kappelman's first witness, Gerald Gardner, the handyman who found Samara and the target of suspicion by Adam Frosch. She was laying in the bottom of the pool like this. So she had her arms kind of up? Mm-hmm. One arm was up and the other one just laying down the side of it. It was both like this. Did you ever think Mr. Gardner could have done this? No. 
I didn't. Then, a shocker. The prosecution calls a surprise witness, Dale Folsom. Folsom? He's a career snitch. I mean, I, I had a hard time convincing myself to take the word of this guy. Mr. Folsom, do you know Adam Frosch? Yes, ma'am. How do you know Mr. Frosch? He was my cellmate for about six, six or seven months or so in the county jail. The 40-time convicted felon and confessed drug addict since the age of nine, Folsom came with some serious baggage. In this case, I went and talked to Dale, and he's talking about things that I knew were accurate. Was this something he could have read in a newspaper? No, most of it wasn't. Very little of it was stuff he could have read in a newspaper. And they got into a physical fight? Yes, ma'am. And he said, what happened? He hit her in the head? For the club, golf club. And what happened after he hit her in the head with the golf club? She fell, and then he said he checked on her a little bit later and realized what had happened and said he didn't mean to kill her. And he was you know, upset when he told me, but he said he didn't mean to kill her. It just happened, and he got scared and ran. So threw her in the pool and then ran. Why did he throw her in the pool, if you know? I imagine he did it out of instinct, but probably you know, to cover up the... I guess when you do commit a crime like that, you want to try to cover your tracks. So. In case you're wondering, Folsom received a break on his sentence for his cooperation. Did you confide in him? No. Did you ever talk to him about any specifics of your case? No. Folsom also claims Adam asked him to get the golf club out of his house once Folsom was out of jail. A big club like a driver, a big fat one. He said he would tell me which one. He didn't tell me exactly that day, but he said he would let me know. There was a bunch of them there, though. Did you ever talk to him about the golf club? No. Never. I just told him I was a golfer. You know, I played golf. In fact, investigators did find a golf club in the house, and it even had Samra's DNA on it. But when the medical examiner takes the stand, the whole golf club story blows up in the prosecution's face. He looked at that golf club, and from looking at it, plus everything else that the autopsy disclosed to you, it's your opinion that the golf club did not cause those injuries. Is that correct? It doesn't appear that it did. Adam denies this, of course. In fact, he claims that police and prosecutors planted the club and tried to frame him. Let me explain the golf club thing. The golf club thing happened like a year and a half after Samra's death this golf club mysteriously shows up in the house. After my dad had put the house up for sale, cleared the whole thing out, plus my dad, he's a golf nut and sports um, fanatic, so he would never have left a golf club in the house like that, just leaning up against a window. The investigators planted that golf club. I have proof of that. I wouldn't have been in there because I'm a golfer. If there'd have been a golf club in there, away. I'd have had it. The medical examiner says basically a golf club did not kill Samra. She doesn't say that. She said she didn't think it was a golf club. She can't rule it out either, but she just felt like the head of the club would be so hard that it would split the skin and you would see bleeding, which we didn't have in this case. She believed the injuries were more consistent with a fist. I think they got in a fight over his girlfriends. I think it escalated quickly and I think he knocked her out. And when she's not coming up from this fight, the last resort was to throw her in the pool, make it look like somebody else did it. Moves the hose around the pool, flip-flops underneath the hose. There's another flip-flop in the pool. It looks like it's a completely staged scene. And that's what made it a first-degree murder when he made the decision to put her in the pool while she was still alive and make the scene look like an accident. So it's possible her life could have been saved. I believe so. After less than two hours of deliberation, the jury reaches its verdict. State of Florida versus Adam Frosch, we the jury find as follows as the indictment, the defendant is guilty of first degree murder. So say we all this 26th day of January 2017. The sentencing is just as swift as the verdict. Stand up, please, Mr. Frosch. I do adjudicate you guilty, first degree murder, sentence you to life in prison. The outcome is long overdue. Justice for prosecutors. You put your heart into this. I did. Into fighting for Samra. I mean, she doesn't have any family here. You're essentially the person in her corner. Yep. Fighting for justice. And that's the way I felt in court. Like, there's nobody else here to speak up for her. 
Adam will spend the rest of his life behind these walls, yet he remains defiant in his claims of innocence. And I'll you know, say this, every one of their witnesses they put on the stand lied, and I can prove it. They made untruthful statements. Lost in all this tragedy, perhaps, is the result for two little girls who will now live without either parent. They've lost both. They have lost both, and that's terrible for them. I want the girls to know about the mother, that she was one of the most beautiful human beings, and she has class and love and compassion, and she loved them very, very much.